Today we'll talk about AJAX and jQuery. For many years, web developers strive to create web applications that look and feel like desktop applications. But despite tremendous efforts, we are still not quite there yet. Today, if I give you a desktop application and a web application, you can probably tell them apart quite easily. Take Eclipse for example. We can tell that it's a desktop application because it uses a rich set of GUI components, not just text fields and buttons, but menus, panels that can be resized and dragged around with their own menus, and uh, tree structures that can be expanded and clefts, toolbars uh, two can be easily customized, and so on. And it also feels more responsive than a typical web application partly because it doesn't need to load data from a remote server, and also because it uses partial, partial redraw, which means, for example, if I open or close a menu, only this area of the screen is updated. This is different from a traditional web application, where if something on a page changes, the whole page gets reloaded. So basically, compared to web applications, desktop applications tend to look better and feel more interactive and responsive. As programmers, there's not too much we can do about the looks, but we can do something about interactivity and responsiveness. Interactivity has a lot to do with event models. For example, if you want to pop up a window when a user mouse over some text, there has to be a mouse over event first. For web applications, the HTML4 event model is widely supported by various browsers. As we can see, HTML4 defines a number of events from page load to from page load and unload to mouse clicks and movement and key presses and so on. And then there's the DOM level 2 model, which is quite similar to the HTML4 model in terms of events, but the specification is much more rigorous, including how events should be propagated, captured, and cancelled. And of course, there are also browser-specific event models. Now let's see a simple example of event handling. Here, here I'm trying to display the coordinates of the mouse cursor. If, if we start from the upper left corner, we can see that the coordinates are close to 0, 0. If I move the mouse down, we can see the Y coordinate increases and uh, when I move the mouse to the right, the X coordinate increases. This is the code for the page. The exact code is not quite important. The purpose of this example is to illustrate several things. First, we can associate some code with an event, like the mouse over event here. And uh, this code is called an event handler. And uh, second, we can write code to change the page without the need to refresh it, which is here. And the last, the programming language we use to do all this is JavaScript. And that takes us to JavaScript. JavaScript is a scripting language originally developed at Netscape, which was a company dominated the web browser market until Microsoft started to bundle IE with Windows. JavaScript has three components, the core language, and the support for client and server-side development. Since its creation, JavaScript has always been the language for client-side programming. 
In recent years, it has become even more important because more and more web application functions are being pushed to the client side to improve user experience and server scalability. As the popularity of JavaScript continues to grow, there's even a resurgence of using JavaScript on the server side, challenging traditional server side technologies like Java, PHP, and AST. These days, if you want to make a living as a web developer, you have to be very good with JavaScript. Because of time constraints, we can't really cover JavaScript in details in this class. But fortunately, everybody in the class is already familiar with Java. And uh, as you can tell from the name, JavaScript is very similar to Java in terms of syntax. So what we'll do is we'll highlight a couple of non-Java-like language features in JavaScript. And after that, it should be easy for any Java programmers to read and understand JavaScript code. The first language feature I want to mention is how objects are created and represented in JavaScript. In JavaScript, you can create an object like this. For example, suppose we want to create an object called car, so we can call new object, very similar to Java, and then we can assign values to the car object properties, make model year, and a property of an object can itself be an object. So we're creating another object here called owner, and then we assign that object as a property of the car object. Note that this code looks quite similar to Java, but there's a, major ex di uh, there's a major difference. In Java, we first have to create a class that defines all the properties, and then we can create objects of that class. In JavaScript, there's no need to define that class. Object properties can be added dynamically. This is another way to create the same object we just saw. It's called an object literal, as it's just like other literals like strings and numbers. For example, we can say a, we can say a is 10 and uh, b is, for example, a string a, b, c, d. So, just like those, there's no reason why we can simply say a car object is this. If we compare this to the previous approach, we can see that they do exactly the same thing, except that object literal is much more concise. Object literals are used extensively in modern JavaScript code. In fact, nobody writes JavaScript like this anymore. So it's very important it's very important that you are comfortable with the object literal syntax. There's yet another way to specify objects in JavaScript, and this one is known as JavaScript object notation or JSON, as many of you probably have heard of. The difference between JSON and object literal is that the property names can be written as strings as well. JSON is widely used these days as a data exchange format between servers and clients. So needless to say, you should be very comfortable with this format as well. The second non-Java feature is functions as first class citizens of the, of the language. What this means is that in JavaScript, functions are considered as objects just like other type of objects. In particular, we can assign functions to variables. We can assign functions as a properties as properties to objects. We can pass function as a parameter. We can a function can return another function as its result, and uh, we can also have so-called function literals, which are functions without names. Here are some examples of functions in JavaScript. The first one looks very much like a Java function where we declare a function, give it a name, and then the implementation of the function. The second one, however, 
you can see that it's something that uh, we never see in Java, in Java. This is a function literal, and uh, notice that this function doesn't have a name. It's simply called a function. And uh, we can take this function literal, and we can assign it to a variable. And later on, if you want to call that function, we can simply say bar, and uh, that's it. And uh, this this line in this line we assign a function as a parameter to another function. For example, here bar is this function, and we pass that function as a function set as a parameter to the function set timeout. And uh, we can even get rid of the middleman bar and uh, simply pass the function literal directly as a parameter to the function set timeout. So as you can see, overall, functions are first-class citizens in JavaScript in the sense that uh, they are just like other objects. They can be assigned, they can be uh, anonymous or, or literal, and uh, they can be passed to other functions, returned by other functions, and so on. So, OK. Believe it or not, with our knowledge about Java and uh, JavaScript objects and functions, we are almost ready to write some JavaScript code. But because JavaScript it is used primarily on the client side, we also need to know a little bit about client-side JavaScript. As we saw in this example, JavaScript code can be included in a web page using the script tag. The code can be directly written in the page, or the code can be included in a separate file and linked from the page. And the browser is responsible for running this code. The number one job for client-side JavaScript is to process a web page. For example, adding visual effects to the page, changing the page based on user input, displaying server response on the page, and so on. We know that a web page, in a sense, is just a text file. So it's possible to process a web page as a big block of text. However, doing so would be very difficult, both in terms of parsing the document and in terms of changing it. A much better idea would be treating a HTML document as an object. For example, if we think of this document as a tree-like structure, where the top-level element HTML is the root in the tree, and then the root would include a number of children nodes, and each children node, for example, head would include its own children, title, and so on. In this case, if we want to search for an element, it becomes very simple because all we need is to traverse this tree structure. And adding an element, for example, becomes also pretty simple is because we can just add a node to this tree. And that is exactly the idea behind document object model, or DOM. Under DOM, when an HTML page is loaded by a browser, the browser is responsible for parsing the page and creating an object representation of the page. The object is a tree-like structure, like this one, where a node in the tree represents an element in the tree, and the, ch ch the children of the nodes are the elements inside those elements. As I mentioned, now, manipulating a document becomes simply manipulating this object. So what do we usually want to do with a document? Well, let me close this. Well, usually we'd like to find some elements, change some elements, and sometimes maybe creating some new elements. 
And of course, there are JavaScript methods to do that. For example, to find elements, we can use get element by ID, or we can find them by name, or find them by tag name. And to modify elements, there are a number of ways to do that. The most commonly supported way by different browsers is using inner HTML. And there are other methods we can use to add, change, remove attributes and the child elements and so on. And of course, we can create new element and new test nodes. So let's put all this together and see how it works. Here I have a web page which has a table, a uh, hello line on top, and a form that says first name, last name. If I type in a first name and last name and then click this button, this first name and last name is added to the table, and also it replaces part of the hello line and uh, replacing hello world with hello that name. If I change it to, for example, another name, and it does the same thing. If we look at the code, it's nothing we haven't seen before. So the the HTML part of the code looks like this. Notice that uh, in, in the first line, I have a span element with an ID who. And uh, the table has an ID T1. And the form has a name F1. And uh, the two input fields have name, first name, and last name, respectively. And the, the button has an ID click and it has a event handler to handle the click event. So what happens when I click this button? Well, it that click is handled by the click event handler, which takes us here. And uh, the first couple of lines, what we are doing here is we first get the elements by the name, so it will return this and the, this elements. Because name attribute is not unique in HTML, so when we say get elements by name, notice that it's a plural form, meaning that there are there could be multiple elements that have the same name. We know that there's only one element has the name first first name in our page. So we can simply pick the first element returned by this method and then we get the value which is what we have input here. Same thing for the last name and then we use get element by ID to get this span element and because ID is unique so get element by ID returns only one element and then we simply concatenate first name and last name and use it to replace the content of this element. And that's why we get the display here. And then we try to create a new row and add that new row into the table. So what we are doing here is we are creating a new row using create element. And then we create two table cells and then we create two text nodes each will be placed in one table cell and then we we put them together by putting the text into the cell putting the cells into the row and then putting the row into the table so although it looks like quite a few lines of code here but it's very straightforward and uh, as you can see it's just some simple usage of the basic functions and methods that let us to, to find elements, to modify elements, and uh, to create new elements. Those are you know, the typical things that we 
we do when we use JavaScript to manipulate a document. So we can do that and that's great. Now let's take a step back and look at the big picture. Remember that our goal is to create web applications that provide desktop application experience, and that requires better interactivity and responsiveness. Now we have our solution for interactivity, which is a combination of HTML event model, JavaScript for event handling, and DOM for document manipulation. This, of course, doesn't mean our web applications will automatically become highly interactive. It will still take lots of hard work and cre creativity by the developers. But at least we have the tools to do that. And that leaves us with the question, how do we improve responsiveness then? An important observation about traditional web applications is that a big reason why they feel unresponsive is the synchronous request response model. What we mean by synchronous is that if the browser sends a request to the server, the browser will just freeze there until the response comes back. And depending on the network and server conditions, this moment of freeze can be quite noticeable and lead to very poor user experience. So later people came up with something called XML HTTP request, which was first implemented by Microsoft in the IE browser and later was implemented in all modern browsers. XML HTTP request is a JavaScript object that can be used to send a request and receive response. And in particular, the response can be handled asynchronously, which means the browser no longer has to wait for the response. What means is like this. After sending a request, instead of waiting for the response, the browser can continue to do other things. In other words, we eliminate the wait here so the user doesn't feel uh, the so the user doesn't feel a moment of freeze. Now, if you look at this code, you may say that, wait a minute, the idea seems good, but the code obviously won't work here, because if we don't wait for the response, how do we process the response here? Aren't we going to get a null pointer exception or something? Well, you are absolutely right. The code won't just work like this. Asynchronous request response actually works like this. Instead of writing code sequentially, we put the response processing code into a separate method, which is often called a callback function. So after a request is sent, the browser can continue to do other things. And when the response comes back, this callback function will be automatically invoked to process the response. Another probably easier way to understand this callback function is to think of it as an event handler, which it actually is. Just like a click event handler, which will be called when a user clicks a button, this response handler will be called when the response comes back. Now let's look at an example of an XML HTTP request. So what, they, what this example does is if I click a button, it will display a random number and that random number is retrieved from a from server. On the server side, I have a very simple servlet and uh, we have do get and do post, which does the same thing. In the do get method, we simply create a random number and then we send the random ba number back as a response and the response is very simple it's a text response and uh, just it contains just a random number now on the client side we 
HTML part of the page is again quite simple, which looks like this. And uh, it has a span element, which originally shows point zero, uh, zero, uh, 0 0.1. And uh, it has a button and, uh, of course, a click handler. In this click handler, we create a new XML HTTP request. We set a event, uh, we set a callback function on that request, and that callback function will take the response text and then assign it to the content of the number element, which is the span element, and that of course is why the number returned from the server is displayed here. And uh, that's kind of what the code does at a conceptual level. But if you look at the actual code, it's actually much more complicated. Uh, for example, just to create a XML HTTP request, it takes this much code to do because different browsers implement XML HTTP requests differently. And also, this function is actually not the actual callback function. And the actual callback function is actually a function returned by this function, which uses this function as a parameter. Those details are not quite important, because as we see in a moment, you'll probably never write code like this when you actually implement an AJAX operation. It's just a example that illustrates the usage of basic XML HTTP requests and how asynchronous request processing is done. Now, let's finally answer the question, what is AJAX? AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. In a sense, it's JavaScript plus XML HTTP request. XML HTTP request allows the server, res allows the server response to be handled asynchronously, and the JavaScript is used to send the request and change the web page based on the server response. As I mentioned, XML HTTP request was developed by Microsoft for the IE browser, and it didn't receive much attention until Google used it to implement Google Map. At that time, there were already other web map applications like Yahoo Map, but they worked like traditional web applications where you click buttons to move around or zoom in or zoom out. When Google Map came out, people were shocked because it's probably the first popular web application that felt like a desktop application. You can drag the map, you can use mouse wheel to zoom in and zoom out, and it felt very responsive even on slow internet connections. So people studied Google Map code and found out that it used XML HTTP request. And since then, AJAX became a big thing and it's the beginning of the so-called Web 2.0. Here's a quick summary of a typical AJAX operation. Notice that on the server side, it's the same as before. In other words, for the server, a request is a request, and an XML HTTP request is an is a HTTP request just like any other. So there's no difference on the server side. On the client side, however, a request is no longer initiated by a user clicking on a link or a button. Typically, the request is created inside an event handler, and the callback function is provided to process the response and update the web page accordingly. I want to emphasize that when we talk about an operation being AJAX, it has to have a server component. If the operation doesn't communicate with us, it's a server, it's just jar, not AJAX, because there's no asynchronous and no XML HTTP request. 
If we just want to understand Ajax at a conceptual level, we can stop here. But if we want to actually use Ajax in real development, we need to learn a little more because using plain JavaScript and XML HTTP requests is just too difficult. The first problem is that each browser has, its, has their own JavaScript implementation, which means that code works on some browsers may not work on others. And there's a lack of pre-made GUI components, which is a big problem for us programmers. And as we just saw in our previous example, this one, Operations is quite tedious to implement, even for something as simple as getting a random number from a, from a server. And, th and this is where all the JavaScript slash Ajax libraries and frameworks come in. As we can see, there are quite a few of them. Just for JavaScript, there are a bunch of this, and for Java, there are a bunch of them. And for each language, you can find one or more of these libraries. In fact, there was a time when everybody and their brothers were creating Ajax libraries. Over the years, most of them became obsolete, but as we can see, uh, there are still quite a few left. So let's say if we only have time to learn one library, which one do we choose then? Fortunately, there's one library that emerged as the dominant one, and that's jQuery which also has a companion library called jQuery UI that provides a number of pre-made GUI components. jQuery currently is the most commonly used JavaScript slash Ajax library by a large margin. For example, if we see some statistics, This chart shows the usage of JavaScript libraries by the top, top 10,000 websites. We can see that jQuery is used by over 85% of the sites, while the second ranked, which one is the second ranked? Yeah, the second ranked Yahoo user interface is only at around 3%. And uh, it's the same, roughly the same for top 100,000 sites or top million sites or other sites. And this is good news for us because we only need to learn one library and uh, that's uh, in most cases would be enough. So let's see a jQuery example then. And uh, it's this one. So although this is a fairly simple example, it touches upon almost all the important aspect of jQuery from selectors to event handling to DOM manipulation and so on. So first of all, notice that uh, this example does exactly the same as the previous one, uh, which is which is this one. So, so here again, if I type in a first name and last name, it adds first name and last name to the to the table. Change uh, hello to hello uh, the name, and uh, it's basically doing exactly the same thing as before. Except, of course, uh, you can see that the code using jQuery is much more concise 
standard code using uh, using regular JavaScript. First of all, to use jQuery, we have to include the jQuery library, and uh, that's pretty uh, easy to do. Which is uh, what uh, we did here. You can simply link to a local copy of the jQuery library or a copy hosted somewhere online. Currently, there are two versions of jQuery to choose from, version 1 and version 2. Functionally, they are actually the same. The difference is that version 2 has dropped support for IE 6, 7, and 8, and I'm using version 2 here. When you first read jQuery code, the first thing you probably notice is that lots of things start with a dollar sign. And uh, that dollar sign is known as a jQuery wrapper, written as either jQuery parentheses or most commonly just dollar sign parentheses. What it does is returning some existing or newly created elements. We can use selectors to select existing elements. Here are the basic jQuery selectors. We can select element by ID. So if an element has the ID foo, we can select that element by saying foo plus a, a pound sign. And uh, we can also select elements by their tag name, or we can select elements by CSS class that they have, and uh, we can specify the CSS class name plus a dot. And we can also select elements by name, for example, uh, sorry, by attribute. For example, this one will select all the elements with an attribute called name, and uh, this one will select the elements with an attribute called name, and uh, that attribute has to have the value Joe. Selectors can also be combined together by concatenating selectors, we can select the elements that meet all the conditions. For example, here we are selecting all the div elements that have the CSS class foo and the attribute called bar. And if we separate selectors by comma, we can also select the elements that meet any of the conditions. For example, here, we are selecting all the, ele uh, all the div elements plus all the elements with the CSS class foo plus all the elements with the attribute bar. jQuery also supports some other selectors and filters, which we won't cover here. Please check out the jQuery documentation if you need something more complex than the combination of the basic selectors. Now, knowing what we know about selectors, let's go back to the code. And we can see that uh, this one is a selector, and uh, it's selecting an input element which has an attribute called name, and the value for that attribute is first name. And if we look at the HTML part, we can see that the only element matches that selector is this one. So here we are actually selecting the input field here. And the same thing here, we are selecting this input field, and here, we are selecting an element with the ID who, and uh, we can see that this is the, the span element here is what's being selected here, and uh, this one is selecting the element with ID T1, so this one select the table element, and uh, of course this one select an element with the ID click, and uh, it's selecting this button here. So, selectors will give us some elements, but what can we do with them? Well, here are a few things we can do. We can get and set their content, 
properties, attributes, and values. Note that these methods are like getters and setters in Java, except that the getter and the setter have, have the same name. If we pass an argument to the, to the method, it's used as a setter. For example, if we say If we pass a string to the HTML method, then it's, it will work as a setter and set this HTML string to the content of the element. Uh, if we don't pass any argument to this method, it's, it functions as a getter, which will return the content of that element. We can also manipulate the CSS classes of the elements by adding or removing classes, toggling a class on and off, and check if an element has a certain CSS class. Knowing this, again going back to the code, we can see that this one and this one will get us the value of those two elements, which are what the user has what the user has entered and uh, this one will set the value of the first name variable to the content of the whole element and uh, this is why we are getting the first name here it's setting the content of the whole element here So now we know how to get elements and change elements in jQuery. What about events? jQuery supports many events. Let's go to the documentation and take a quick look. Events, events, events. And uh, no, events, not effects. Yeah, events. For example, if we look at keyboard events, we can see we have key down, key press, key up. And uh, if we go to mouse events, we can see we have click, double click, hover, mouse down, mouse enter, lead, and uh, so on and so forth. In jQuery, Event handling typically takes this form. Select an element or elements, choose an event on that element or elements, and attach an event handler to that event. Note that this is different from our previous example where we specify where we specify an event handler as an attribute of the element itself. And uh, this jQuery style of attaching event handler is known as unobtrusive JavaScript. The idea is that style, behavior, and the structure of a web page should be separated. Style should be in CSS style sheets, behavior should be in JavaScript, and they should not be mixed with the elements which constitute the structure of the page. One of the jQuery events is particularly important, and that's the document ready event. This event is triggered when the DOM hierarchy of the HTML document is fully constructed, and the event handler of this event is usually where most of the JavaScript will go into. There are several ways to use this event. The first, the most formal way is this, which basically says, get the Get the, get the document event and uh, attach an event handler to the ready event. The shorthand form of this is this, where document can be omitted. And there's even a shorter hand form, which is also the most commonly used, where the event itself is also omitted and be, it becomes just dollar sign parentheses and the handler. And uh, 
if you see our code, it's uh, now you can understand uh, what's happening here. So we're essentially attaching an event handler to the document ready event. And this whole function is an event handler. What that means is when the document is ready, run this function. And uh, also we can see that uh, we have a click event and uh, this whole function is the event handler for the click event of this click element, which is this button here. So far, we learned how to get elements, get their content and values and so on, and how to handle events. Oftentimes, we also need to change the structure of the DOM by adding, removing, and replacing some events. We won't get into the details, but enough to say that jQuery provides all the tools for DOM manipulation. Here, Here's a simple example using the append method to insert a child node into the table element. In the last example, we'll use jQuery to implement the AJAX operation we did in the previous example, which is, which is this one the example where we get a random number from the server. And now we are going to re-implement this using AJAX. As you can see, our previous implantation using just regular JavaScript and XML HTTP request, it takes about five it takes about 50 lines of code to do that. And uh, with jQuery, we reduce that to a few lines of code here. And uh, obviously, it's much, much more concise. If you look at jQuery documentation, you'll see that jQuery provides a number of functions that are related to AJAX uh, to related to implementing AJAX operations. Of those functions, this AJAX, this AJAX function is the most general purpose one, which is the one that we are using here. So the, the typical syntax for this function is URL which is the URL on the server side that will receive the request, and the optionally uh, object called settings. And the, this object has a number of properties we can set to customize how this AJAX uh, operation would work. And uh, you can see all the properties of the settings object here. There are many, many, many of them. Uh, there are only a couple of them that are the most important. Uh, the first is a data property. If you want to send any parameters to the server, you can put the parameters in the data object and pass it as, uh, as the pro data property of the setting, settings object. And of course, we would need a callback function to handle the response when the response comes back. And uh, that callback function is, uh, is, the, uh, is the success property of the settings object. So if you look at the code here, the URL is A1, which is the URL of the servlet that will handle the request. And uh, for the settings object, we set two properties. One is the success property, which is the callback function. And the inside, we get the data returned from the server and set it to the content of the number element, which is here. And uh, we also use the cache property and we set it to false. And this is so that uh, this code will work in IE because IE does caching pretty aggressively. If you don't have 
let's probably set it won't uh, work in IE, although it will work in other browsers. Because we are not setting, uh, we are not sending any request parameters to the to the server. We are not uh, using this data property. So if we try this. We can see that it works exactly the same as before, but uh, as we just saw, the code is much, much more simplified thanks to thanks to jQuery. So this is the end of this lesson. Uh, one last thing I want to say is that uh, I know many students in the class are not uh, very familiar with JavaScript. But uh, you don't have to be. Don't be afraid of writing JavaScript code, even if you are not a JavaScript expert. As we saw in our examples, JavaScript is a very powerful and at the same time very concise language, especially with the usage of jQuery. You can do many very interesting things with with very little code. So uh, think of it using in your web applications. The more you use it, uh, the better you'll get. And you don't have to be a ex -Java JavaScript expert to start.